This is Susan Bassey with a very special holiday First Amendment audit where I'm hoping you will join me in educating an attorney who graduated an undergraduate from UC Berkeley. He went to Chicago Law School and then he went to Harvard University to get a PhD. But despite all of his fancy education, this attorney, Ward Penfold, doesn't seem to know the basic law when it comes to the First Amendment, and he's going to need a little bit of our help. My name's Susan Bassey, and we're going to be doing a First Amendment on it on a freedom of religion. So you guys are going to be on YouTube. You got to go to my channel. Just look for First Amendment audit, freedom of religion. My name's Susan Bassey. I know. They haven't said no, so hey, that's a good sign. That's what special qualifications you have. You know, I'm not done. Conditions are repeatedly violating Marcy's law. Yeah. This is me battling it out with a government attorney, Ward Penfold, who doesn't seem to know very much about the First Amendment. Mr. Penfold represents private divorce attorney, Nicole Ford, and the director of Victim Witness Services, Casey Halcone, who works under Jeff Rosen. It seems Ms. Halcone and Ms. Ford were unhappy with speech of victims who they failed in the local courts. They tried to keep me from those courts and the public buildings so I filed an anti-slap lawsuit against them. That's a lawsuit that prevents people from trying to violate your First Amendment rights and trying to chill speech in a manner that allows them protection they're not afforded under the law. You have repeatedly violated a number of issues related to the Okay, we're going to talk about the fact that you have a witness interfering with evidence in this case. On December 16th, Government Attorney Ward Penfold was served with this USB drive that had evidence that showed the Santa Clara County District Attorney and his star witness, Scott Largent, had obstructed justice in an anti-slap case. That's what special qualifications you have. Fortunately for me, two grandmothers that I know on Facebook, Kathy Cohen and Sue B, managed to preserve the evidence the District Attorney was trying to hide and they had it uploaded to the Socioeconomic Justice Institute's YouTube channel. This is fucking crooked. Jeff Rosen, crooked. Mr. Rosen probably committed perjury in a civil harassment case to keep me away from the county buildings and courthouses because he knew if he kept me away, he wouldn't have to hear what the victims of this county had to say about how he has managed the district attorney's office and victim witness services. This is fucking crooked. Jeff Rosen, crooked. Abuses range from pornography to groping to rape. There are over 12 abusers, over 20 officials who broke mandatory reporting laws, but not a single criminal charge has been filed. Sexual predators are free to, free to roam our streets. The officials at presentation who covered up abuse and directed others to break the law, who intimidated kids out of filing police reports and knowingly endangered thousands of children, no charges. Are the police and DA actually investigating or are they just placating us? We can't get any answers. We can't even get copies of our own police reports. We also didn't have a German car, no Volkswagen, no Mercedes, no BMW. Nazi cars is what my dad called them. Robin Yamans, who made a special appearance for me in this case, is German. Mr. Rosen, you are failing victims in this county. You are lying about what you are doing. You are stealing state and federal money. 
Now, as one of my colleagues who is a public records expert recently pointed out, Mr. Rosen manages a great deal of state and federal money that is earmarked to protect victims of crimes. And as a result, he is subject to public scrutiny over how he is spending that money. And when he wanted to request security detail, he had to go to the Santa Clara County Supervisors, to Dave Cortezzi, to Cindy Chavez, and to the others who managed the public money. And Mr. Rosen had to tell them why he was so afraid of me that he suddenly required to have two armed guards with him and escorting him to and from public meetings. I, on the other hand, knew what Mr. Rosen and Casey Halcone and Nicole Ford were really afraid of. I hope your children will be proud of your legacy, Mr. Rosen. I don't think they will be. When I've lived in this county for 30 years, and I have never been more disappointed in humanity than I have been with this county, and you in particular, Jeff Rosen. When this county decided in its infinite wisdom to put victim services under the control and management of Jeff Rosen, it failed every victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, rape, and numerous crimes, even white collar crimes. Mr. Rosen, you have failed everyone in this county. Last week, I had a remarkable experience. I have spent the last five years working with the media, everyone from the Metro up to the New York Times, to try to get coverage of what is going on in our family courts. I have provided documents. I have spent countless hours with reporters, publishers, and editors, and I can't explain it. So I have failed at my job. I know I have failed at my job. And my job is very similar to that of yours. And that is when someone comes to me, we make a decision whether we believe them or we don't. And whether a victim can convey clearly and concisely what has happened to them to make them believe should not be the issue. We have child abuse hotlines where nobody answers the phone. We have had hundreds of millions of dollars in state and federal grants go to this county. And Ms. Calhoun, tomorrow at noon, that's going to hit you square in the face. I have sat with you where you have told women whose husbands have been convicted of felony abuse on a spouse, where you told them you can't help them in family court. These women need money. These women need help. And this is not just women. These are our children. They're watching you. They're watching. And every day when you go home and you think about how you did your job and who you helped, you think about how much money you make. And you think about what you actually did. Last week, Mr. Rosen hired two investigators to follow him to the elevator to prevent me from asking him questions. When I got to that elevator, I asked him if his children would be proud of him. His face gave me his answer. Separation of church and state in our democracy isn't in the plain language of the First Amendment, it's more in the spirit and the philosophy, and it's what judges are supposed to determine in making sure that there's an arm's length distance when looking at politics and religion in our communities, even our local communities. And if Mr. Penfold is a little fuzzy on what arm's length distance means, it's a condition of a fact that the parties in a transaction are independent and on an equal footing. We have repeatedly violated a number of issues related to the government. Okay, we're going to talk about the fact that you have a witness interfering with evidence. In this. That's what we're going to talk about. So procedurally, you may modify the order to allow me to go to public buildings and courthouses without any restraint. And you can have your little people who are all upset, give them all the protection We're supposed you to meet confer about the procedural issue. The procedural issue the is the issue before the court today. Is the modification the of the restraining order. It's really exhausting trying to educate Mr. Penfold, not only on the First Amendment, but on the law, since he doesn't seem to know it very well, even though he's been to Harvard and Chicago School of Law, and he has a history degree from UC Berkeley. But Mr. Penfold on this day was very upset about the witnesses that I had subpoenaed because I had subpoenaed Mr. Rosen, but I had also subpoenaed two people who had worked for Casey Halcone, who had been involved in an affair and who had been misusing state and federal money while they were having that affair, and that was a little embarrassing to Ms. Halcone. 
It also showed that victim services was not operating with the arm's length that the law required in managing state and federal grant money earmarked for crime victims. The extension. And I'm not agreeing to anything that restrains me from county buildings or public courthouses because you are all lying and making things up. It is public corruption, and the federal government needs to come in here and look at what you and the district attorney are doing. Well, it's willing, collusion, you're, you're and you are going to, to be added into my federal complaint. When an attorney, an officer of the court, misleads a judge or makes an omission, it's a violation of Business and Professions Code 6128 and a misdemeanor. When they obstruct justice, it's a felony. Now, it's been concerning what lawyers have been doing related to these sexual assault cases, and Jeff Rosen is no exception. In fact, he may be one of the most corrupt in all of America. You're and welcome you, to pursue that. Okay. The issue we're supposed to be meeting referring on, we've just resolved so because you're you not decide. willing to stipulate to a continuation of the current no, TR. No, I'm not. I don't okay. want to be restrained. So that's what we're for. And to we're also judge. going to talk about your bad faith litigation tactic of serving me something on a Friday in violation of CCP 1005 that made me do that all weekend long. What I had to do all weekend long was because Ward Penfold, the attorney for DA employee Casey Halcone and private divorce attorney Nicole Ford, filed a motion in violation of CCP 1005 out of desperation to stop the Santa Clara County District Attorney from being subpoenaed as a witness. But that's okay. Thanks to a little help from my friends, I come loaded for bear when dealing with these attorneys. And it's clear this Harvard-educated attorney doesn't know the law very well, so we're going to educate him. Perhaps those who drafted the Constitution and the First Amendment understood that religion should be first, that people should have a place to choose where they will worship, where they will assemble, and where they will associate. But that Constitutional First Amendment also provides that these places of worship are not without the need for transparency and the need for a free press to make sure that there are not abuses going on in these religious institutions. On a street in Los Gatos, California, where I used to drive my children to school every day, there are four corners. One is dotted by the Presbyterian Church, and across the street from that is a Jewish synagogue known as Shir Hadash. The other two corners hold a public school and an assisted living center for our seniors. And while I drove down this street every day for years, it never occurred to me that there might need to be some transparency in these institutions as well. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um. Yeah, I'm wondering if Rabbi Aaron is in. She is not. She sh should be back fairly soon. Did you have an appointment with her? Um, no, I sent her an email, and I'm trying to speak with somebody. I'm doing an investigation, and I wanted to speak to somebody about some issues going on with the congregation. Okay. Is there someone I could speak to besides sure. Rabbi Aaron? Um, there's our executive director. What's your name? My name is Susan Bassey. Hi. Hi. What's your name? His Hi, name? I'm Scott Largent. Hi. Hi. Good to meet you. Um, we're not ready to speak with you. I'm going to ask you to leave. Um, I had some questions too about the te former teacher at your school. No, I just no one, no one I just learned that he had a child pornography for found on his computer, and that the congregation knew, and that they didn't do anything about it. Is that correct? You don't have any comment. No. You don't have any comment. Thank you. Rabbi Melanie Aaron has refused to answer any of our emails or phone calls. We've sent her the information that we have, 
including the confidential settlement agreements that confirmed that there were sexual abuse cases in the congregation involving rabbis and members of that congregation that were there to convert to Judaism. We also were investigating Rabbi Melanie Aaron for her involvement with Silicon Valley Faces when Casey Halcone, Sahir Stefan, and Netta Redman were there processing claims for victims, including all the claims that were made before that victim services unit was moved under the district attorney's office. And we were investigating an appearance that there was a million-dollar donation made to Jeff Rosen's political campaigns that never made it to his financial disclosure list. And the last complaint we were looking into was insider information that members of the Shir Hadash congregation, out of loyalty to the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office, had used their congregation in an effort to try to get Sheriff Lori Smith removed from office. Lori Smith had reported sexual abuse claims that should have been investigated by the DA's office or the Los Gatos police, and they were not. We continue to investigate these issues because we believe they need transparency, that our leaders in our religious organizations or our politics that are dealing with victims must have the highest ethical standard, and this is not a place where secret settlements belong. And victims certainly deserve their privacy, but the settlement agreements that indicate a pattern and practice of sexual abuse in any religious organization simply cannot be tolerated. As soon as it came out and we came to terms with what what had happened and, and stuff, um, I just told my brother, I'm like, we got to stop this guy. I was naive. I thought that justice would be served. I thought that right would be done and that I trusted the system and I trusted the players in the game. I remember him leading me into the tent. It had just feeling like I was being like led, you know, like I was being led to, you know, like I knew I was going to like die or something, or like I was being led to the slaughter, you know. Well, I can look back now, I don't really understand, but you know, it started pulling me and getting aroused and whatever. And then his eyes changed to like hate, you know, like anger, hate. I don't know if I passed out or if I like totally disassociated or whatever. You know, but I wake up, he's on top of me and he's wearing the collar and he's got his hands around my throat and he's pushing me as hard as he can into the uh, into the ground, you know, saying, say it, say it. Like I, I came out of whatever I was in and I think he was trying to get me to say I wouldn't tell or something like that. And, and I remember in that, I'm feeling like I'm not going to get out of this. Like, I'm totally alone. I'm not going to get out of this. You know? Like, I, I thought he was going to kill me. And I didn't even really, re you know, I, I just couldn't believe, like, he broke me. Side of the law. Mr. Lynch drove 50 miles, used a fake name, put on gloves, and beat up and bloodied an elderly man. Well, that was how the prosecutor saw it. The jury did not agree, so to speak. The retired priest got on the stand, and he denied that the abuse ever happened. But then in a very strange twist, just two days into his testimony, his attorney stood up and said, Father Gerald Linder will not testify any longer, invoking the Fifth Amendment right to self-incrimination. <clears throat> I was responsible for enough, the death of enough people to assure my place in hell. This may be the only true statement that Brad Baugh said in the 40 years he practiced in family courts in Santa Clara County. Because attorneys like Bradford Baugh did to children in family courts what Jeff Rosen has done to them in criminal courts. And while Brad Baugh has destroyed families for over 40 years in the area, what he did with Rebecca Fry was perhaps the worst. In the case where a young mother who worked for Cisco 
jumped off the overpass when she could no longer take the pressures of family court. Rebecca Fry and Brad Baugh went to work, making sure that the reporters wouldn't be told what was going on in family court. Rebecca Fry and Brad Baugh went to the young woman's funeral, and they acted empathetic. And when they were done, they got to work in the courts, and they collected over $800,000, and they sealed up records and secrets so that nobody would know what they really had done to this woman and her children under the color of law. In pouring through thousands of court documents in the family court and the probate courts, I could find no answers as to how judges who oversee courts of equity could allow attorneys like Rebecca Fry and Brad Baugh to do to this woman and her children what they were able to do. And yet it was on a visit when Gloria's sister came out and tried to see her nephews for the first time in a number of years that I finally got some answers and we could finally see what we had known was there all along because it was on this visit to Gloria's house where her boys had grown up that this bright light shone across the yard and no matter what angle I moved the light followed Gloria's sister as if to say to have faith and as if to have proof and answers that sometimes we practice not in our religious institutions, but we practice truth and faith by believing in each other and believing in something much bigger and brighter. And when there is transparency, that truth is a little easier to see. So Mr. Penfold, this was your first First Amendment lesson. We have 11 more to go.